Thank you so much. I am so excited to have 45 minutes to share with you how I view one of the most important things that we can think about, the relationship and the intersection between humans, food, diet, health, and our environment. And I'm going to do that in two ways. I'm going to spend less than a second demonstrating the moment that everything changed for humans, and then the next 44 minutes and 59 seconds explaining what that really means. And it happened just like this. 3.4 million years ago, our ancestors created a tool that actually was almost exactly the same size as this. And I don't know if you can see it, I can see it with the light behind it. That edge is razor sharp, it is one molecule thick. The moment they created their first stone tool, stone tool with one strike, it took me two, but with one strike, they completely transformed their relationship with their environment. They were no longer restricted to their own physical limitations and could interact with the environment and their food in entirely new ways. Several months ago, I received an email. I, probably many people here receive a lot of emails with a lot of crazy questions, and this particular email had these three questions in it. This person was trying to understand, I had just done a podcast and talked about, I'm very passionate about dairy, raw fermented dairy, and uh, they heard me on the podcast, was very confused about dairy and, and, and what it means, and was trying to figure out and, and navigate their own ideas about what diet means to them, and trying to understand if dairy was something they should have in their diets and ask me these three questions. And I'm gonna use this as a platform to try to um, uh, navigate the next 45 minutes of the conversation. And so keep these, keep, I'm sorry, I missed a slide, I'm sorry. I do have to do these disclosures and I think it's a great way to understand where I'm coming from. So I am not a medical doctor, my PhD is in archeology span and anthropology and I have a lot of hands-on experience with things that many people are just studying in books. So I am an executive chef at the Modern Stone Age Kitchen, my family's restaurant. Um, I'm the director of the Eastern Shore Food Lab, which is our nonprofit. Uh, I wrote, obviously, uh, Eat Like a Human, and co-starred in uh, the National Geographic series, The Great Human Race. And if you've never seen this series and you're interested in our, di in our ancestral past, I do highly recommend it. We spent uh, about nine years of my life replicating what our ancestral uh, life was like, our shared ancestral past for the past, in that case, 2.5 million years. And it gave me a lot of insight and, um, and, and, and views on the world that I otherwise wouldn't have gotten. Currently, I'm, I have an association with University College Dublin, but I've spent over 20 years of my life as a college professor. Um, I'm an archeologist, an anthropologist, and a chef. So that intersection of food, ancestral diet, um, uh, traditional and, uh, and ancestral approaches to food, and actually putting food on a plate in our modern food system is the perspective that I currently have. And, and, and this information is coming from. And most importantly, I am a father and a husband. And in, in addition to trying to uh, feed myself and nourish myself properly, I've spent the past 20 plus years trying to do the same for my family. I am an animal-centric, low-carb, connected diet uh, advocate. So to address this question, where is nutrition headed, go back to these, questions, uh, these three questions to hit the button too fast. We're gonna try to think about, over the next 40-something minutes, what foods are we designed to eat, what foods are meant for us to eat, and what nutrition does the human body need? Because most people that are trying to understand what they should be putting into their mouths to be the healthiest humans possible are asking at some level one, if not all, of these questions. One thing I'd like to start with, however, is we know that humans are, most of us believe that humans are omnivores, but we are not omnivores by design. We are omnivores through technology. And because of that, we need to change the narrative. Humans deal with food in a completely different way than especially any wild animal in the world. We require technological input in almost all of our food system. And the question we need to ask is not just what, 99% of the conversations about food, diet, and health have something to do with answering the question what we should be eating. It's a question I ask my entire life. And the, the, the question we should be asking, and when I give you this anthropological and archeological perspective on our ancestral diets, you will realize that the question we really need to be asking is also how we should be eating. The approach to food and how we process food is the key to understanding not only how we were built as a species, but how we move forward and nourish ourselves in the best 
most nourishing, ethical, and sustainable way possible. And it's a 3.5 million year ancestral dietary path that holds the key. So in the next 40 something minutes, I'm gonna do my best to go through three and a half million years worth of prehistory. So we are, in, you know, we celebrate these incredible members of our species that have you know, athletic you know, prowess. We have people like Usain Bolt, Michael Phelps, Arnold Schwarzenegger. Now, I know Us Usain Bolt's one of the fastest humans on the planet. Michael Phelps, one of the fastest swimmers on the planet. I realize that Arnold Schwarzenegger isn't the strongest human on the planet, but I grew up with Arnold Schwarzenegger movies, so I always put them on the, on the slides. <clears throat> they are absolutely incredible, and we should celebrate how, um, what they've been able to achieve with their bodies and with whatever, um, whatever thing they're trying to achieve in, in the sports world. But we really need to realize and be humbled that comparing them with other animals, the fastest, the fastest animal on the planet is a Southern Californian mite. The fastest swimmer on the planet is a sailfish and the strongest animal in the world is a dung beetle. Pound for pound, it's a dung beetle. Now, I know that doesn't make a big, so who, who really cares? We're really talking about human diet and health here. Well, it makes a big difference because when we think about food, there's two things we really need to consider. One is, how do we get our food? And then what do we do to our food before we put it into our mouths? Compared to other animals, we are biologically one of the weakest species in the entire world. Right? We, and if you look at these animals and you look at the, you know, the, what they have, their biological traits, they are perfectly designed to get certain foods and deal with certain foods from their environments. We don't have any of those. I had a humbling experience several years ago. My family and I, I was on sabbatical from Washington College and I was doing research for the book and my family and I had the opportunity to move to Ireland for the year. And Ireland was our home base and we traveled all over the world from there to do all this research. And you'd think it was a magical thing and it was. But our kids were not very happy to pick them up and move them away from their friends, to move them away from an average uh, middle-class home in America to this tiny little cottage in Dublin. And we lived on this little farm in Dublin that was a, it was a working farm, but an educational farm. And at, at the end of the night, it closed up and these walls, you know, these gates were closed and there was nobody allowed on there, which my wife and I loved. But again, the kids were, were separated from things that they knew. <clears throat> and we had been there a few weeks. And one morning, and we had one bathroom and they weren't used to that either for all five of us. So one morning we got up and there was a particularly, uh, tents in the house and the kids were not doing very well. And I, I, I looked at them and I said, I know what I'm gonna do. Like, I know exactly what I need to do to solve this situation. We're gonna go foraging. And the kids looked at me and I, I turned a bad, a bad situation into a, into a worse situation. I said, no, 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 that's it. And I actually won, this picture was taken of us that day. If Norman Rockwell painted a picture of a family foraging, he would have painted this picture. It was perfect. But it, we, get, we get them into the car, we start driving them, they're all upset. We're going foraging. Dad, what are you talking about? Like, what are you talking about? We're going, we're going foraging. Went down to the Wicklow Mountains, and it was a perfect time to go foraging. And I pushed them out of the car, and we started foraging, and we started foraging, and we were foraging. And minutes turned into hours, and hours turned into almost an entire day. And eventually, it worked. Like, it actually, they loved it. And the only thing I don't like about this picture is my wife's not in it because she actually took the picture. Otherwise, it was the perfect picture of a perfect scene of a family engaging with their food and their environment and forgot about all the other crazy strife. And we gathered all this food that we got and we got into the car and I put it on the console. I, I physically patted myself on the back that I was the dad, I figured this day out. And my son says, hey dad, where are we gonna stop and eat on the way home? And I, and I literally, well, I turned around the other way because the steering wheel was on the other side. I turned around and, and I, I was about to yell. And then I looked down at the food we had collected. Five people, an entire day, collective foraging with our hands. I didn't have enough food to feed my family for one meal. I did not collect enough nutrition from one full day of foraging in a beautiful place like Ireland, the Emerald Isle, and we stopped and got burgers and a Guinness on the way home. But, but, the reality, but, but it was a very humbling moment. It was a truly humbling moment to just use our hands and our fingers and try to get nutrition from the environment is not only difficult to do, it is impossible to do. We don't possess things like digging claws. We don't have the ability to fly. We don't have incredibly strong teeth and, and jaw muscles and we've lost a lot of our musculature and the, the bony structures that those, that muscular attaches to over a long period of time. We don't have the speed or strength to go and, and jump on our food and, and, and take it down at will. 
but we have this. We have these incredible brains. And these brains over millions of years have worked to create technologies, starting with a stone tool just like that and moving through a whole bunch of other technologies to allow us to overcome our physical limitations and extract increasingly diverse and nutrient rich um, foods from our environment. We don't have digging claws, but I've spent a lot of time with hunter and gatherers all over the world, and every hunter gatherer group in the world has some version of a digging stick, a simple stick that allows us to dig in the ground. We don't have the ability to fly, but we create all sorts of climbing apparatus, ropes and ladders that allow us to climb trees and cliffs and get eggs and get honey and those sorts of things. We don't have the kind of uh, muscles that would allow us to break through nuts, but almost everywhere in the world there's some version some version of a uh, nutting stones. And we don't have the speed or the strength to jump on animals. And I know, for those of you who know about things like the um, carrier hypothesis and the idea that we can run animals down you know, over endurance, endurance runs, we can. It's, it's true. Humans, over the long haul, because we can regulate um, our, our breathing and, and we can do certain things, we can uh, t take animals down over about a 20 some marathon distance. But the reality is it never made a huge difference in our diets in the past. And by the time you hunt an animal down 20-something miles away, you've got to bring it back 20-something miles. So the reality is the fact that we can take, create things like bows and arrows and boomerangs and fishing nets and all those things that allow us to take animals down at a distance introduced animals into our diet in a very, in a very important way. But mo more importantly than the actual technologies we created that allowed us to get food from our environment, we have an incredibly inefficient digestive tract. When you look at other animals, we have, uh, in comparison to them, we have an incredibly inefficient digestive tract. This is a picture from that same farm we lived on. Beautiful Irish grass, cows, any one of us, anybody who knows anatomy, you could stick humans out on that field and we would die of starvation eating the same grass because we can't process it internally. Our guts currently are 60% the size of what is expected from a similar size primates. Not only are our guts small, our guts have shrunk in relation to our bodies over time. Our teeth have also shrunk over time. Now, there's a couple things in this picture I really want you to take away from, from the next couple minutes. Number one, go from left to right. Left is about two and a half million years ago. That's Homo habilis. Then the, next to that is Homo erectus. Then Homo neanderthalensis or Neanderthals. And then modern day Homo sapiens. So if you just pay attention to the numbers, that's the general increase in brain size over the past two and a half million years. It's not linear, and it's, these aren't the only species we should be paying attention to, but these are the ones we, we typically talk about. Um, that, that's a huge increase in brain size. Brains right now require about 20% of the nutrition that we take in to fuel. They're an incredibly nutritionally expensive part of our bodies. So an increase in brain size like this means an incredible increase in the amount of nutrition required to properly fuel those brains. So one thing you can see is we have a huge increase in brain size. Look at the teeth, right? The teeth on the bottom, especially the, the, the post-canine teeth, if you look at the molars, if you just look at the teeth themselves, I know it's hard to see, but they shrink. They're getting smaller over two and a half million years. Now, if you look at the size themselves and compare that in, you know, in comparison to the increase in brain size, that is a drastic reduction in tooth size in comparison to, to body and also brain size. What does that mean? The two things that we have, we don't have a lot going for us as far as getting food from our environment, processing that food in our bodies. The two of the very most important things that we have, our gut and our teeth, are getting smaller through time as our nutritional needs are skyrocketing. It should be the exact opposite, but that's, that's exactly what's happening. We don't possess things that other animals possess that allow us to take in nutrition and digest that nutrition properly in, in a way that's safe and efficient. So the, the top two, we, we can't eat that grass because we don't have a rumen. We don't have the palate that a cow has. You know, when, when a cow takes in grass, it has a, a corrugated palate on the top and these huge teeth that break down the grass. Then they swallow the grass. It goes into a, a, a chamber of their stomach that's designed. It's the rumen for fermenting that tough vegetable materials. Then they throw up in their mouths. They do it again. And it goes back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. And it isn't until it's ready to go and, and properly broken down chemically and physically that it goes through the rest of their digestive tract. We don't have that ability to deal with tough vegetable materials. We don't have canines like that lion to rip up our carcasses on the African savanna. And we certainly don't have the internal ability to deal with grains properly. 
That picture on the bottom is a picture of a gizzard of, I believe it's a duck or a turkey. You know, gr granivorous birds have a, either a crop or a crop-like structure that when they eat grains, and they're eating raw grains directly from the plants, they take those grains, it goes into a crop, and it sits there for sometimes 14 to 16 hours in this warm, moist pouch. And in that pouch, those grains soak, they ferment, and they sometimes even sprout. There's a lot of detoxification and chemical breaking down that happens in that crop. And then they swallow it and it goes into a gizzard. And in the gizzard, these birds are intentionally eating rocks and gravel that sits in the middle. And there are these two muscular discs that take these grains that have been detoxified through that soaking and fermenting, and it grinds the grains. And then it goes through the rest of their digestive tract. We don't have any of those sorts of things. But many of us are eating tough vegetable materials. Many of us are eating meat. And Probably not many of us here eating grains. So, but what do we do? What, what have we done over time? Well, we have replicated those processes externally from our body, extrasomatically. So we don't have the rumen, but we create fermentation chambers, mason jars on our, on our countertops, crocks that we bury in the backyard or put into our basement to allow that fermentation to take place. Anyone who tells you that we shouldn't be eating meat because we don't have canines, don't realize that we haven't needed those canines for three and a half million years because in less than a second we can create a tool that's sharper and more durable than any other tooth, any tooth or any other part of our body. We don't have, and I know we're talking about grains here for a minute and it's a low carb conference, but bear with me, we don't have a gizzard, we don't have a crop, but we have things, that's actually a cornstone from Ireland that operates exactly, literally exactly the same, same way, stone grinding those grains that it happens inside of a granivorous bird's digestive tract. And then you make something like sourdough bread, you are replicating that entire process and then baking it at the end. As a, as a very quick side note, um, there is, just to show you the power of those processes, I always wondered, looking in the anatomy of birds, if, if we took a grain and actually bypassed the crop and the gizzard and just kind of stuck that grain in later, which is what we do as humans when we just eat regular bread, you know, what would happen to those birds? And then I figured I'd never know. And then I just learned about six years ago that there is a disease called angel wing disease that happens with the ducks and the geese in the city parks when the nice old people feed them the bread. And they actually, it's, it's, it's a disease of malnourishment because they are feeding, they're feeding actual birds grains, right? But been through a human system of processing, it doesn't allow it to ferment properly, doesn't allow it to break down properly. And here are these birds that are eating a form of the food they're physically designed to eat, but they're actually getting sick because of, we, we've bypassed that system. So essentially, we as humans get food and nutrition in one of two ways. We use the digestive tracts of animals to turn unsafe or inaccessible nutrients into blood, fat, organs, connective tissue, meat, milk, chime, which is the stomach contents of, uh, which is fantastic as well, and consume them. And we can break those down. And or we replicate those biological processes that take place in animals and to make food safe and nourishing before we eat it, before it even touches our mouths. Our ancestors developed those approaches and those technologies to turn food into their safest, most nutrient-dense and bioavailable forms possible for their bodies. Quick side note, that's a picture from Bolivia. Um, that is how the first, I'm sure many people here eat jerky. That's, we were making charque, the, the earlier version of jerky there. But again, just this idea that what we're doing, what we were doing, what food processing meant for three and a half million years was how do I take this new ingredient for my environment and transform it into its safest and most nourishing form possible for our bodies. This is the kind of technology we're talking about. None, none of it is rocket science, right? We have digging sticks, fire, stone tools, grinding stones, ability to hunt at a distance. Simple, but incredibly powerful technologies. And it's because of these technologies that we're sitting here in a room like this, in these bodies with brains this big. So very quickly, what I'd like to do is just go through a little bit of the hallmarks of three and a, actually a little bit over, about five million years worth of our dietary past, which in my mind, uh, you know, focusing on the biggest takeaways. Number one, gatherers. Five to seven million years ago, we were gatherers. Our ancestors stood about three and a half, on average, about three and a half feet tall with brains about the size of my fist. They were collective foragers, very little animal, based food went into their diets and they did fine. Like they were able to support these bodies and these brains and the diets that they had. Low nutrient density 
and their foods were, in, in their diets, and their foods were, number one, by default, hyper-seasonal and hyper-local. Right? They, weren't, they weren't storing anything. They were collective foragers. They had no technology that allowed them to do anything other than use their fingers or their toes or their teeth to get any food from their environment. Issues are, number one, it's, you know, the, all plants have some level of toxin in them and they had no detoxification strategies. So not only were they forced to eat incredibly hyper-seasonally, but they only had a limited uh, amount of what is even available then that they could safely derive any sort of nutrition from. They had no ability to break down that food before they ate it to get more nutrition out of it. So we're talking about a limited amount of wild fruits, limited amount of wild vegetables, and a whole lot of insects. Insects obviously being the most nutrient-dense and bioavailable bio of, of those three. Then it changes, then we, get to, then we become scavenger gatherers. This, with a, a, literally a tool that looks exactly like this, um, they were able to introduce meat into their diet about 3.5 million years ago. We have evidence for um, intentional butchering of animals, uh, of scavenged animals about 3.4 million years ago, and we actually have found the tools themselves that did the butchering that date to about 3.3 million years ago. So are, they're not hunting, they're scavenging animals that were left on the savanna by some other predator. And the way that it typically happens is something like this. And we see the same sort of thing on the savanna today. Huge apex predators, when they take down an animal, take that animal down, rip it apart, and gorge themselves on the blood, the fat, and the organs. They don't sit there usually and just kind of hang out and gnaw on the shoulder. They know that the most nutrient-dense and bioavailable parts of the animal, the biggest bang for their buck, are is the blood, the fat, and the organs, and they gorge themselves. And typically, once they're full, they go off and sleep somewhere, sleep on a right, nice warm rock, kind of like we do after Thanksgiving, we've eaten a little bit too much and we sleep on the couch and then come back for seconds, then they come back. But they leave this carcass covered in flesh on the savanna. And that gives time for safely for other, other animals that are physically designed to be um, scavengers to run in. So things like buzzards and hyenas today, millions of years ago would be the ancestors of buzzards and hyenas would come in and they're designed both because of their digestive tract and also because of their claws and their teeth to get the flesh off of these carcasses. Our ancestors didn't have that ability. I mean, they were much smaller than us and they had nails like this and teeth like this. But when they created that tool, they could then join that party and introduce meat into the diet for the first time. When they introduce meat into the diet, nutrient density and um, bioavailability in their diets does increase. What's very interesting though is for a million and a half years, we don't see much anatomical change in response to the introduction of meat into the diet. And there could be several reasons for that. I'll go back to. Two million years ago, we start hunting. And at two million years ago, everything changes. There's actually, there's two, there's two um, technological innovations at about two million years ago that make a huge difference. One is we begin to hunt, and two, we, um, many of us believe we have access to fire, or we can control fire at that time. So cooking opens up a whole realm of possibilities in our diets, but what I wanna focus on here is the hunting aspect. When we start hunting, we become the apex predators. We are the hunters that can take that animal down and have first access to any part of that animal. We can decide to go after the blood, the fat, and the organs, and also the flesh. It is at this moment in our evolutionary past that our brains and our bodies jump in, with the biggest leap that, we have, that we've ever seen. And I'm convinced that part of that is because we've been able to introduce such incredible nutrition into our diets. Then the next, and obviously a lot of things change after that. We just improve hunting technology, improve uh, 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 plant processing technology, and lots of things are happening for millions of years. And eventually, the next biggest change, as we know, happens at the agricultural revolution. When we hit the agricultural revolution, we have a huge influx in grains. Typically, it's one or two staple grains, depending on where you are in the world. Rice in Eastern Asia, maize in South America and Central America, um, other types of grains in the Fertile Crescent and in England. And it's not only do we have this huge influx of grains, but it's at the expense of the other types of foods we have in our diet. Archaeologists suggest that somewhere, and there's a lot of diversity where we're looking with this, but somewhere between, um, in a, you know, for a hunter-gatherer diet, we have over 300 different plants and dozens of different animals in our diet in a given year. And those animals, we're eating the entirety of those animals. That changes literally overnight, and we uh, focus all of our diets on one or two staple grains at the expense of all that diversity and a lot of those animal resources. Huge reduction in nutrient density and huge increase in plant toxins. 
The next biggest change is, we, so at that point we go, you know, we're food producers. We go from hunters, so we go from um, um, collective foragers to scavenger gatherers to hunter gatherers, stay there for about two million years, then most, mo uh, most of the people involved in the food production for us become uh, food producers through farming. And then at the, at the um, uh, industrial revolution to now we become food consumers. Right, so most of us are not engaged at all in the food system, and I don't mean us in this room, I mean us as a, as, as a species, and we are buying our food made by someone else. Drastic decrease in safety in our food system, drastic decrease in nutrient density, and huge increase in, in, in toxins as well. So what does this mean? In addition to our changing diets, if you think about what happens over that three and a half million years, for the majority of that time, up until the agriculture revolution, every single person in a family, in a clan, in a tribe, in a group, was engaged at some level directly with their food. They were either doing it themselves or somebody else in their family was doing it and they knew exactly, they knew everything about their environment. They saw the direct consequences of their actions. If they overforged or overhunted, they, they, they saw what the result of that happened to be. They were viscerally connected with their food system. We hit the agriculture revolution, then all of a sudden things change, right? So a huge segment of the population gets disconnected from their food system while some people are working harder than ever to feed the entire population. Now, when we learn about an eighth grade history class, we look at that, we're taught that's a positive thing because that freed people up to become poets and comedians and <laughs> all the other things that, that, uh, that we place value on as humans. And that is valuable, don't get me wrong. But those people, who are disconnected from their food pay a huge price for it. And so does the next generation, and so does the next generation. Then we go to the Industrial Revolution and move forward, and now a, huge, a much larger segment of the population is dis disconnected from their food, and we become consumers. So a very small segment of our population is, is not only making, but controlling not only the food, but the messaging around the food for the entire population, and that is a lot of control. The disconnect is real and incredibly important. With that disconnect, we are forced to listen to somebody else about our food. In fact, we're all here at a conference to listen to other people about food. And I'm thankful, and I'm very much looking forward to all the other presentations, I'm thankful we have amazing people that can give us information. But the reality is, there is no other animal in the world that asks somebody else what they should be eating. We do, we hire people to do it, and we're in a place where we have to because of that disconnect. And we're forced to listen to other people, and because of that, gifted speakers, writers, and marketers can make anything sound true, right? Extremes get a platform and a voice, we're in the middle of that right now. I mean, anybody watching social media sees the number of hits, the information that gets out there widespread are on the far extremes, and you know, well, <laughs> television, social media. And authentic empowerment comes from direct, visceral connection to our food, where it comes from, and how it's prepared. And that's what I want to spend a couple minutes on. So how did it go awry? I was teaching a class a few, uh, about 10 years ago, and this semester I had one class that was on prehistoric technologies and food and archaeology, and another class was talking about the modern food system. And I had a student that was actually in both classes in the same semester. And a couple weeks into the semester, she came up to me, she goes, listen, Professor Schindler, I, I got a question for you. Like, you're in the class, the archaeology class, you talk about food processing and like you light up and you think it's like God's gift to the world. And then you say food processing in this modern food system class and it looks like somebody just ran over your dog. Like, like what's the difference? And, and I looked at her and I said, I, you're right. I, but I have absolutely, let me think about it and get back to you. I, I don't know. And I thought about it and I thought about it and I thought about it. And what I realized, and which has been the, the platform of most of my research since that moment, it was a pre the, the focus of prehistoric food processing was on safety, nutrient density, and bioavailability. In fact, if you look at prehistoric technologies, for three and a half million years of technological innovation, the Albert Einsteins of every one of our ancestors, all of the best inventors, almost every single prehistoric technology has something to do with food. Almost every technology, either getting food, processing food, storing food, sharing food, redistributing food, almost every single prehistoric technology has something to do with food. And we know that the diets that we, the changing diets we've had over millions of years in, made a huge impact on our, on our biological evolution. And if that's the case, technology and evolution truly can't be separated. This is what almost every one of those technologies is focused on. Safety, nutrient density, and bioavailability. 
the current focus of the food, of food processing is on profit, uniformity, shelf life, addiction to food, marketing, all, all of those sorts of things that we already know at the expense of safety, nutrient density, and bioavailability. These are the kinds of food processing strategies that I'm talking about. None of it is rocket science. These things were done in caves, right? These things were done in huts. These things were done over open fires and clay pots. Things like cooking, fermenting, nishtamalizing, grinding, geophagy, which is the intentional consumption of earth, earth which almost every animal in the world engages in, and I still, there are still people in the world today, uh, humans, that engage in it on a somewhat regular basis. Rendering, soaking, sprouting, drying, slicing, chopping, dicing, coagulating, pre-masticating, aging food, and that is just a small list of the kinds of incredibly powerful technologies that transformed our food system that allowed our, our evolutionary growth to happen. So let's get back to those questions that we started with. What foods are we designed to eat? What foods are meant for us to eat? And what, what nutrition does, uh, does a human body need? Well, here's the first one. I thought long and hard before I answered that woman's email, and I sent her about a 10-page re response. I am truly convinced that the only food that humans are perfectly designed to consume is raw dairy from our mothers. And that's only for a short period of our life, because just like any other mammal, when we get weaned, we begin to lose the ability to safely and efficiently um, deal with that dairy. Beyond that, we're not perfectly matched to any other completely raw and processed food. We require technological input at every place in our diet. And if you are sitting here thinking, yeah, that's not true, you know, I, I, I eat meat, I don't need any of it. Well, anybody went to the steakhouse last night, besides having to take out your wallet and pay for that steak, uh, anyone went to the steakhouse last night, there was a lot of technolo technological input in that meat. A lot before it even got here, right? Raising the animals, slaughtering the animals, butchering the animals, keeping the meat cold, cooking it in the kitchen, and then it got onto your plate, and the first thing you did was you picked up your fork and you picked up your knife. Can you full, full get nutrition from raw, a huge block of raw red meat? Yes. Is it the most efficient way to do it? No. Richard Rangham from Harvard University has done a lot of work in this area, and he notes, and he's done work here, he said, a little bit of physical processing and a little bit of chemical processing through heat allows the nutrients in raw red meat to be more readily accessible to our human bodies. And I mean, it, it's minutia, it's a little bit. But we can increase or, or decrease the amount of input our body needs in order to get the most amount of nutrition from that meat if we do a little bit of uh, physical processing and a little bit of cooking. In fact, in my mind, a medium rare to rare hamburger is, is the best way to do it. But anyhow, technology is required for optimum safety and, and nutrition. So the next question, what foods are meant for us to eat? Now this is sort of an esoteric, like, touchy feel good kumbaya question that a lot of people ask when they're trying to understand what the human place is um, in the world with, with diets. But I tried to explore it and think about it. What foods are meant for humans to eat? Like literally, why are they put on this earth? Human breast milk is meant for baby humans, period. Fruit is meant for post-consumption seed dispersal in, mo in most forms. So you could probably make the argument that fruit is out there for other animals, including us, to eat so that we can then disperse the seeds somewhere else. That's it. Beyond that, flesh is meant to make animals mobile. Organs are meant to participate in biological processes for those animals. Seeds, nuts, legumes, grains, and eggs are meant to be future progeny, future offspring for all of those different plants and animals. They're not meant for human consumption. This is not a productive way, obviously, and I'm not telling you guys anything, it's not a productive way to think about human diet and make decisions. But here's the big question. This is the one I think most people are really trying to ask. What, what nutrition does the human body need? Well, we have literally, I mean literally, outgrown our digestive tracts. We require all food to be processed to make it safe and nutrient dense and bioavailable before we eat it. We are a domesticated ape and we can't survive outside of a culture created environment. So just think about this very quickly. I, you know, there's a lot of different definitions for domestication. And typically the, 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 the definition, the one I usually land on, is you, you, you take a plant or an animal out of a natural environment, you put it in a culturally created environment in which humans are modifying things. We're watering it, we're feeding it, we're fencing it in, we're protecting it, we're giving it medicine, we're doing whatever we're doing to it. Nowadays they do things with test tubes and all this, but we're, we're, we're putting it in an environment that over time 
it biologically changes and in many cases can't survive outside of that environment any longer. And that's a kind of a general definition of domestication. So I get asked a lot, okay, what, what is the first domesticated plant? Well, right now, believe it or not, it, it may be maize. May, I mean, even though I learned a fertile crescent and all this in, in, in eighth grade history class, maize is probably one of the contenders for the first domesticated plant in the world. But regardless, it's somewhere between 10 and 15,000 years ago, depending on the evidence you're looking at. So the next question is, what's the first domesticated animal? Well, usually the answer is a dog. And the dog domestication, it was a co-domestication event that happened probably around 35,000 years ago on the Mongolian steppe. But to me, the answer is us. Our ancestors were the first domesticated animals because something as simple as this technological input three and a half million years ago changed our relationship with the environment. We put ourselves in our own culturally created environment and we biologically changed in response to that. We started to eke out more nutrition from our environments than we ever had access to before because we made digging sticks, we made shovels, we made ladders, we made hunting equipment, we cooked foods, we fermented foods, increased the nutrition that went into our bodies, and our bodies changed in response. And not only did our, did our, was there a huge increase in nutritional needs to support our bodies, but our teeth, because of our technological input was so strong, our teeth were able to reduce in size. Our guts were able to reduce in size. We are now left in these bodies that require so much massive nutrition, but we don't have our own physical apparatus. We don't have a digestive tract and uh, the equipment to get the food from our environment and process it properly to nourish our bodies. The only thing I like to say is I don't care, you know, your bear grills, your whoever you are, you know, every wild plant, you know, the behavior patterns of every animal in the world, and you're super fast and super strong. If I took all your clothes off and threw you in the middle of the woods, anywhere in the world, you would eventually die of starvation because you, unless you created a tool to help you navigate that situation. We are a domesticated ape and cannot survive outside a culture created uh, environment. So very quickly, a couple, couple leaving thoughts. One, a nourishing, ethical, and sustainable food system of the future, because now we're on the future part, requires direct visceral connections. There are so many things we need to do in our food system to make it healthy, make it ethical, and make it sustainable. But to me, it starts with everybody getting reconnected with their food. We need to get, and, and I know some of this sounds crazy, but we have a nonprofit called the Eastern Shore Food Lab, which is focused on research, education, and connecting, reconnecting people with their food, and it is possible to do. We need to get people back into the kitchen, back into the woods, and back into farmers' markets. They need to see, if they're not growing their own food, they need to at least meet the people that are doing it themselves. We need to understand what real, what real food is and how it's made. We can talk all day long about macronutrients and micronutrients and biological needs, but if you walk into a restaurant to order something and you don't know how that food is made, it's, it's, it's very difficult to make an informed decision. We need to reestablish limiting mechanisms. Right? The things that kept certain foods out of our diets and, and kept certain things at different levels are no longer a part of it any, any longer. I have a humongous issue with oxalates, huge. And part of that, is because of the vast amount of almonds that I've been eating my entire life. You cannot, in a prehistoric sense, eat that many almonds. When I was a kid growing up, I would, the nuts that we ate were at my parents' house, or my grandparents' house on Christmas. And we'd go to their, because they were so expensive, we'd go to their house and there was a couple nuts in a bowl with a nutcracker. I would spend all afternoon cracking nuts and I'd get that much, once a year. You can go to BJ's now and buy a bag of nuts, this bag of almonds this big already shelled for you. I mean, there are, reconnecting with our food reestablishes limiting mechanisms that can make a big difference. And one of those is seasonality. We need to return to the seasonality and we need to become immune to advertising and marketing. So even though we ha almost all of us are asking that question, what we should be eating, and it's a question be that we, we do in a modern context need to ask because we're so distant, we should be at a place hopefully in the future where we don't have to need help to figure that out. We have the senses that we have, eating. There are three things in our life that are truly sensual. Safety, reproduction, and eating. And it's not a mistake that they are. And I mean sensual in the, I don't mean sensual, I mean sensual in the fact that all of our senses are firing at all times. I mean, think about that, you know, when something falls on the counter downstairs at three o'clock in the morning, you get up and that, like, that heightened sense of like every part of you is firing and you can hear like you've never heard before. Well, there's a reason for that. If you do those things well, 
if you can reproduce well, if you can keep your offspring protected and safe until they can reproduce and you can nourish them, then a species can continue. If we fail at any one of those, it doesn't work, right? So those three things in our life are sensual because if, and if we do them right, they all feel really good and if we do them wrong, they all feel really, really bad. Eating is a part of that. Eating is sensual because of millions of years of evolving with these diets and understanding how to eat. If we can trust our senses and the million years of evolutionary pressures that prepared us for eating, we should be able to figure out when to eat, when not to eat, and what to eat if we're faced with real food. But we need to focus, and this is where I think as we move forward, we really need to spend a lot of effort. We need to focus on using technology and science to make the raw materials from our environment as safe and nourishing as possible for our incredibly inefficient digestive tract and nutrient needy bodies and brains. And this is where I'd like to end. I have spent my entire life studying ancestral diets. I have been on archeological sites all over the world and I have lived and worked with indigenous and traditional groups all over the world. And I am inspired. I know the modern food system has never been as bad as it is, but I'm inspired by what I see. We are more disconnected from our food than we have ever been. But in many ways, we know more about our food than our ancestors have before. Like they, they don't know the kinds of things that we know science-wise. And if we can blend that together, the future is actually incredibly bright. I don't believe the ideal human diet has yet has been created yet. We still have a lot of work to do. And the link between technology and food and health, it has been well demonstrated. If we use our knowledge for good instead of just for profit, the profitabilities are truly endless. Thank you.